Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest, or in the case of this episode, two guests, take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning stories, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their cores very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. To learn more about estate planning and how you can better serve your clients, visit wealthmanagement.com slash trusts dash estates. Our monthly journal features tax law updates, wealth planning, retirement strategies, and much more written by thought leaders in the industry. That's wealthmanagement.com slash trusts dash estates. Now, as I mentioned, we have two guests this week. The first is a returning one, David Lesperance. David is the founder and principal of Lesperance & Associates and one of the world's leading international tax and immigration advisors. A former Canadian immigration and customs officer, he's established his expertise with major law firms, his own law firm, and as a private consultant. David successfully advised scores of high net worth individuals and their families, many of whom continue to seek his counsel today. In addition, he's provided pro bono advice to many governments on how to improve their citizenship by investment, residence by investment, or golden visa type programs to better meet the needs of his global clients. Welcome, David. Pleasure again, beyond David. Our second guest is Melvin Warshaw, and Mel would like to introduce himself. So in my practice of about 45 years, I've seen just about everything. Began my legal career at the Internal Revenue Service National Office in Washington, D.C., and after spending five years there and going to Georgetown Law Center to get my master's of tax, I moved to a medium-sized law firm in Boston. And then I was recruited to work in the Boston office of McDermott, Will & Emery, a prominent international law firm. Thereafter, I worked at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. And today, my practice is focused almost exclusively on uh, individuals and wealthy families who have cross-border concerns and private client matters with a U.S. tax connection. I'm only admitted in the United States, but my practice consists of clients who want to come into the U.S. or inbound planning, clients who want to leave the U.S. or outbound planning or expatriation, and also a significant part of my practice consists of remediation, making sure that clients who wish to leave the U.S. or remain in the U.S. are fully U U.S. tax compliant, because for most Americans living abroad, complying with our onerous tax reporting obligations is considerable. And in the event they want to leave the U.S. system, they do need to certify to full U.S. tax compliance for the prior five years. Thanks so much for joining us, Mel. Thank you for having me, David. So this week, we're going to be revisiting the British royal family, this time with a, a focus on King Charles III. Uh, the recent coronation of Charles and his wife Camilla after the death of Charles's mother, Queen Elizabeth II, was a massive worldwide event witnessed on television by hundreds of millions around the world, including over 20 million in the UK alone, which for reference, the entire population of the UK is about 68 million. While any coronation would be a huge event, this one was granted particular weight given the nearly unprecedentedly lengthy reign of Elizabeth. Rowan coronation was 70 years ago in 1953 a time before most of the world's current population was even alive. Elizabeth's wrong reign also means that Charles had to, quite famously, wait very patiently for his time to be king, finally receiving his birthright at age 74. And it's that advanced age that kind of brings this week's discussion to focus. Advisors often fall into the trap of speaking about and planning for, air quotes, heirs, as if they're younger people with long lives ahead of them, yet the reality is, given increasing lifespans, heirs are often older than ever, such that often the transfer that requires the most careful planning is not from the initial decedent to the aged heir, but from that heir to his descendants. Now, looking at Charles's heirs, we see an increasingly common situation regardless of wealth. One child, Harry, has left the UK and taken up residence in the US. 
after a brief stint in Canada. As our world becomes more interconnected and people live longer, clients' families are increasingly spreading out, with branches popping up all over the globe like familial McDonald's. It should come as no surprise that when a family spans multiple international jurisdictions, it presents a host of unique planning challenges. However, a savvy advisor can both mitigate the impact of those challenges and perhaps even turn some on their heads to actually work in their client's favor. So Mel, let's start with the challenges. When you have you know, a client with international layers, either they're international and they're in the U.S. or vice versa, what pain points are you immediately looking for in their plan? Well, I want to understand whether the individual has U.S. citizenship or more typically if they have a green card. Unfortunately, obtaining a green card, while from an immigration point of view, gives you 10 years without the need to renew. If you uh, acquire a green card and you stay too long in the United States, then if you decide you want to leave the United States, you could face a very stiff exit tax, and most surprisingly, and unknown to many, many U.S. tax advisors, there's now, since 2008, a very onerous inheritance tax. The inheritance tax would only be imposed to the extent the green card holder has U.S. citizen or resident heirs. And so this is a, um, a trap for the unwary, and I can share some stories of people who didn't realize uh, the difficulties they were putting themselves in when they inadvertently filed a form I-407, which David can explain further, uh, which is the form that many green card holders use to voluntarily abandon green card status. So, Mel, you mentioned an inheritance tax. Um, we talk about the estate tax a lot, the U.S. estate tax on this podcast. We don't often talk about inheritance taxes. Uh, what's the difference? It's subtle but important. So, What's critical to understand is that an estate tax is a tax on the transfer of property, and it's really a tax that the estate pays. An inheritance tax, which is used in many uh, European countries, is a tax that's imposed on the recipient. It's not imposed on the transfer. It's imposed on the recipient. The U.S. in 2008, when we revamped our exit tax rules for about the third or fourth time, we also brought into law the inheritance tax, and it works as follows. To the extent an individual is labeled and classified as a covered expatriate when they leave the U.S., and we'll come back to that as to what the three categories are to be classified as a covered expatriate when you leave the U.S., then any future gifts or bequests back to U.S. citizens or heirs can be subject to the inheritance tax. Moreover, there's no $12.9 million lifetime gift estate tax exemption available to the U.S. recipient. Any covered gifts or covered bequests in excess of $17,000 a year, the current gift tax annual exclusion amount, is subject to a 40% tax. Let me give you a simple example so you understand the magnitude of this onerous tax. If an individual is a grad student at MIT and leaves the United States, with $3 million of cash in his bank account, and that's his only worldwide asset, he has no extra tax to pay because he's got no worldwide appreciated assets and cash is not uh, gonna, that cash is not gonna cause him to be subject to the exit tax. However, he's worth more than $2 million. And if you're worth more than $2 million, you satisfy the net worth test, you'll be classified as a covered expatriate. Now suppose that that individual moves abroad and either inherits $100 million, starts a business, and acquires wealth of $100 million, and is worth $103 million when he dies, and all of his children are U.S. citizens, born to a U.S. parent, U.S. citizen parent. And to the extent the $103 million is distributed back to U.S. recipients, the U.S. recipients have to pay that 40% tax. It's an amazing tax. It can apply 30 years after the person died. It can apply a trust the individual set up. And it's extraordinarily difficult for lawyers like me to get around it. There are a couple of ways to deal with it, but it's not easy. Uh, furthermore, the law went into effect in 2008, some 14, 15 years ago. However, the IRS has yet to issue Form 708. Form 708 eventually will be the form the U.S. heirs would use to file 
and report their gifts from a covered expatriate. The burden will be on the U.S. recipient to demonstrate that the person that they received the gift or bequest from was not a covered expatriate. And so, as you can see, there's it's an endless amount of time by which the law, this tax could apply, and it can apply to after acquired property. So you could leave the U.S. relatively modest, acquire a lot of property outside the U.S., and because you want to send it back to U.S. recipients, there's a U.S. inheritance tax imposed on those recipients. But David, we've talked about expatriating a few times already, and Mel's already sort of brought up um, some of the required forms. Now, expatriating, it's much more than just like saying, I renounce my U.S. citizenship or making some grand gesture. There's very specific ways and very, you know, that this has to happen. Um, do you mind sort of running through that process a little bit for us? Sure. And and we'll get into kind of the misconceptions about citizenship and green cards and those types of things and how it impacts what Mel just said. But the so in order to renounce your citizenship, you are exercising a right, but you need to do that in front of a U.S. consular officer at an overseas mission, embassy or consulate. The difficulty is the getting an interview for them. During COVID, that was extremely difficult because a lot of the offices had closed. Some offices like the UK or or Canada are, are backlogged a year, year and a half to get appointments. You need to have an appointment to exercise this. You do, however, have the ability to travel if you're willing to do so. And we have clients kind of flying. Oh, I have a client that's flying into, into Buenos Aires in, in a few days to expatriate. Uh, so there is a, a whole process, forms, et cetera. We prepare clients. They renounce their citizenship. They pay a fee upon that. that and they at that point, they have given up their U.S. citizenship. Mel then referred to a form called 8854 and kind of three tests, which are to determine whether you are what's called, what he, he called a covered expatriate or what the legislation calls a covered expatriate. Do you have more than $2 million in worldwide assets? And that amount is the same as 2008. It is not indexed for inflation. The second is you have a certain average over five-year federal tax paid of currently mail 190 190, 190. adjusted for inflation and then the other part which mel alluded to when he was doing his introduction is you have to certify your u.s tax compliance if you trip any one of those three you fail to certify you have been paying too much average tax or you have more than two million in worldwide assets then you are what's called a covered expatriate most people then know about the deemed disposition, the exit tax, 877A. But what Mel was talking about, and which we are increasingly finding clients are completely oblivious to, is 2801, which is the inheritance tax, which the covered expatriate is then imposing on U.S. recipients of future gifts and or bequests. So that's the process for that. But the other area that, and, and when people give up their U.S. citizenship, they know that they've done it. There's a lot of acts that they need to do in order to do that. Where you get a lot of confusion is on people who lose, who, uh, on green card status. I have a lot of people who say, well, my green card, my permanent resident uh, registration card expired. I said, and, and so I'm no longer a have a green card. I'm no longer a green card holder, green card being one of the ways that you're a U.S. person for tax purposes. And I say, well, do you think you lose your citizenship when your passport expires? And of course, the answer is no. Likewise, you may not, or, or you probably have not lost your immigration status and have lost your tax status. Now, we can also go for some a couple of British examples here where Somebody didn't appreciate that they were a U.S. citizen, a, a gentleman named Boris Johnson, former prime minister, former member of parliament as of a few days ago, born in the United States, left when he was a very young child, was at this point the, the mayor of the city of London and had happened, never filed the U.S. return, wasn't really aware of that obligation, sold his principal residence in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom said, Fine, we don't tax capital appreciation on principal residence, but the U.S. said, 
hold on a minute. U.S. person for tax purposes, we do. You just sold an asset. We want our our piece of capital, uh, uh, the capital gains tax on that. Another even more recent is the current occupant of number 10, Mr. Sunak. He didn't become a citizen. He was born in the United Kingdom. He then went to school in the United States, went on to get a green card, work for Goldman Sachs. He then went back to the United Kingdom, but very specific rules that immigration lawyers aren't generally aware of and tax lawyers aren't generally aware of, which is while he maintained the immigration status, he wasn't counting towards that long-term capital gain that Mel was referring to, which was a tax thing because he had filed an 8833 treaty election. So while you still have the immigration status, you've stopped the clock in effect towards mm -hmm. marching towards that long-term green card status. So one of the things is, you know, I, I consider myself kind of a, a tax savvy immigration advisor, and I would call Mel an immigration savvy tax advisor. And when we started working together, it was kind of like two unicorns meeting in the forest going, oh my God, <laughs> you exist. And I can understand what you're saying. And that's the problem. Too many people just talk to a tax lawyer or too many people just talk to an immigration lawyer and that siloed advice gets them in an enormous amount of trouble. And and Mel can now tell you, and, and he referred to something called an I-407. You lose your green, your green card status if you trade up to citizenship, die, you are caught by a port of entry official upon entry who identifies you as somebody who may have abandoned it and they report you and you go through an administrative process and taken away, or if you relinquish your citizenship filing a form called an I-407. In contrast to the U.S. renunciation, an I-407 can actually be mailed in or it can be signed at a port of entry. So there isn't this kind of you know backlog or, or, or waiting list. But what happens from an immigration point of view is somebody will arrive in front of a U.S. port of entry official, which can occur in the United States, or if there's pre-clearance in a place like Dublin or Toronto, it can happen there. And the immigration port of entry, well, I think, sir, that you've abandoned your, your permanent residence here. I, the port of entry official, have two choices. I can either report you and start an administrative process, kick you out, not allow you entry until that's that's gone through. But I don't really want to do the paperwork for that. And as a former port of entry official, I can tell you, you know, when I was going through law school, I can tell you we prefer not to do paperwork if you can. Or, sir, I'll give you an alternative. You can sign this nice little form called an I-407, and you will re relinquish right now your, and there's not even a fee charge for this, you'll relinquish your green card status and I'll let you in as a visitor. And of course, path of least resistance, the person will typically sign that, not realizing that bells are going off in the, in the mind of somebody like Mel. So yeah, Mel, you can tell that we, case. You mentioned yeah. that, you, you know, that you did this during, when yeah. you were a, uh, a port of entry officer, were you an expert on international immigration and tax law yet? Or uh, did oh, that come uh, later? Absolutely not. I mean, you have an amazing amount of power as a port of entry official with very little training. So uh, I didn't realize exactly going to be giving the most sound advice uh, on sort of the ramifications of signing this form. It's just sort of sign this form so we don't have to. Well, it would be the equivalent of, of going to a police officer for, you know, advice on your upcoming criminal trial. Mm -hmm. And so, David, let me just make a, a point to follow up on a comment that David made concerning filing a treaty tiebreaker election. So in 2008, Congress amended the tax code, the tax code to add what's called code section 7701B6, which confirms that an individual will cease to be a, treated as a lawful permanent resident for tax purposes only if that person is classified as a resident of a foreign country having an income tax treaty with the US and they file a treaty tiebreaker claim on form 8833. So that individual still retains their green card. Okay, so they still have their green card for immigration purposes, 
But for tax purposes, on their tax return, they took the position, they ceased being a uh, permanent legal resident of the U.S. for tax purposes, and therefore, that year in which they filed the treaty election could be the year in which they're deemed to have expatriated. That comes back to when you filed your treaty election, had you held your green card for three years or 10 years? Well, if you held your green card for three years and you're deemed to have terminated your U.S. income tax residency, this shouldn't be a problem. However, if you do it after 10 years, you got a problem because the rule is that if you submit this treaty tiebreaker form 8033 claim in the eighth year of holding a green card, then that will trigger the exit tax. And not a lot of people realize that. They think they're going along still holding their green card, but their tax advisor tells them that they should claim treaty tiebreaker relief and claim because they don't have any U.S. income tax. And generally, if you file the treaty tiebreaker, then you're only taxed on U.S. source income. You're not taxed like a resident alien on your worldwide income. So just to clear up and take things back a notch here, you know, we talked about resident aliens, residences, domicili- domiciliaries. These are, this is a lot of uh, legal jargon for some of our advisor audience. What are the, the differences in, in these various statuses? We're talking about a resident versus a domicile versus a resident alien. So let me break this down and say that for U.S. income tax purposes, income tax purposes, there, is a, there are objective tests. Do you have a green card and are you physically in the U.S. with it? And once you come into the U.S. with your green card and you leave, you're still a U.S. resident alien. Or do you satisfy the substantial presence test, which which is an objective day counting test with a rolling formula uh, that if you spend too much time in the U.S., you'll be considered a U.S. income tax resident. The burden, so to speak, of having U.S. income tax residency is that you are subject to U.S. income tax on your worldwide income subject to possible relief from the 70 or so uh, double tax treaties that the U.S. has with countries around the world. For gift estate and generation skip tax purposes... Sorry, Mel, also citizen for the income. Oh, yes. I said... Yeah, and citizen. Thank you. And then for transfer tax purposes, it's a completely subjective test. The test is, are you physically present in the U.S.? with the intent to remain. It's a test of domicile. Domicile is a question of intent. And for example, if an individual holds a green card and they're physically present in the US, the presumption, the presumption is that they are a US domiciliary entitled to a $12.9 million lifetime estate tax exemption amount, but with certain limitations on their ability to make gifts to non-U.S. citizen spouses or to leave money at death to non-U.S. citizen spouses. You do have this situation where if an individual holds a green card and they move away from the U.S. with really no intent to go back to the U.S., that person could be a U.S. income tax resident because they still hold a green card. They never sent in an I-407, so they still have a U.S income tax consequences, but they likely are no longer a U.S. domiciliary Mm -hmm. for transfer tax purposes. And that means if you're not a U.S. domiciliary for transfer tax purposes, your only exposure for U.S. gift, estate, and GST tax is on U.S. situs property. U.S. situs property, of course, includes U.S. real estate and any tangible property located in the U.S. at the time of transfer. But is a big distinction for gift and estate tax purposes. For gift tax purposes, all intangible property is not subject to gift tax. So if I own Microsoft stock or Apple stock and I live in Australia and I'm not going back to the U.S. with a green card, then in all likelihood, I can make an unreported gift. It's not subject to gift tax, but it's a gift of an intangible. On the other hand, if I'm unfortunately not well advised and I die owning the Microsoft stock or the Apple stock, 
that's considered a U.S. CITUS asset for estate mm -hmm. tax purposes. And the problem for non-domiciliaries who don't live in the U.S. is only a $60,000 estate tax exemption amount that's not adjusted for inflation. So it's virtually certain that any non-domiciliary of the United States who owns U.S. stock or a piece of U.S. real estate will have U.S. estate tax. That is the reason many of these individuals set up Cayman or BVI companies to own the U.S. site as assets, to block, to serve as an estate tax blocker and block the U.S. estate tax on the U.S. site as assets. It's really these dueling uh, sort of tax statuses that you know, sort of bring up the complication that, that you were initially speaking about at the very beginning of our conversation, right, where someone may expatriate to reap the income tax benefits, but, you know, to escape from the uh, the clutches of the U.S. tax income tax system. However, that can have unforeseen consequences for them for their future transfer tax that they may not have even thought about. Yes, it's hard to it's hard to explain this. Every situation is different. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got parents living in foreign countries setting up trusts for U.S. children because they don't want to leave their stock in their Indian company to their children because their children will have an estate tax, so, uh, whereas there's no estate or inheritance tax in India. So you typically would advise an Indian to leave the stock in trust. And then we'll get into, if you would like, I'll just touch upon it, that the U.S. has three anti-deferral tax regimes that apply to Americans living abroad or uh, individuals who own foreign stock. And for example, we've got the control of foreign corporations, there's PFIX, passive foreign investment companies, and there are strategies for people to come into the U.S. owning stock in an Indian company. Uh, one of the common strategies is before the individual moves to the U.S., so let's say they got a green card, but they haven't yet moved into the U.S., you would have that person consider filing a check the box selection to treat the ownership of the stock in the Indian company that mom and dad set up as a as a partnership because there's more than two, there's at least two owners. That means that if it's not a, a corporation and it's a partnership, cannot be subject to the PFIC rules. That's all good. No CFC, no guilty, no PFIC. And then the other concern is when parents set up foreign non-grantor trusts and one or more of the children are in the U.S., we have a throwback tax. It can be pretty onerous when a trustee makes a distribution of accumulated prior year income and gain to U.S. persons. And David, we Mel and I kind of have two groups of clients. We have Americans who are either going to be Americans living abroad or Americans who are expatriating. We also, of course, because the U.S. is an immigration destination country, we have people from all over the world. We have lots coming from Latin America. We've got we can talk about a South African family that we've got right now. We've got non-doms who, because of an inborn labor or a probable labor government in the UK, may want to go somewhere else. And of course, the U U.S. is just you know it's a always been in one of the major immigrant countries because of uh, lifestyle, business opportunities, education, et cetera. So if we use, for example, the South African family that we have, they've finally decided, you know, that things have deteriorated in South Africa with, with rolling uh, brownouts and there just haven't been a lot of increase in, in, you know, increased violence and, and the infrastructure is kind of falling apart. They finally said, fine, we're, we're done. Now, generation one, mother and father, have an extreme amount of wealth. Generation two, their adult children and their spouses and children, they want to leave South Africa and go and live in the United States and, and raise families and, and start kind of careers and do things in the United States. But we don't want to expose the family wealth. So there's a number of different strategies. They've all immediately said, oh, okay, well, they were sold by kind of salesmen, an EB-5, which was, which the end result of which is a green card status, which is, as Mel said, a makes them a U.S. person for income and capital gains purposes. Um, and if they actually move there, then, then they, they could definitely be argued 
uh, at some point that they've acquired a domicile of choice in the United States and are going to be subject to U.S. estate tax. So in that kind of case, we look at different type of planning and we say, okay, fine, generation two and three, you can go into the United States. We'll do as much planning uh, as possible, but we're going to keep the bulk of the family wealth out. Generation one, we can put you in uh, in a place like Bermuda or even a Canada, which doesn't have a estate or wealth tax, and, and we can do a number of different things, and you can have access to the United States to visit your children and grandchildren and businesses and, and whatever, but you're not going to get a green card, which would make you an income and and subject to income and capital gains tax. And we're also not going to make you a domiciliary in the United States. And there's a whole bunch of complex planning that we do on that. Of course, generation one is going to pass at some point. And Mel, we, part of the planning will be, how do we then get monies to generation two and avoid generational skipping tax, generation three, et cetera. And so that's from an immigration planning What's going on? I'm just going to get a green card. And that's what the salespeople will tell you because they get paid a commission to sell you a green card. But, you know, whether you're coming from Latin America or Asia or or places like South Africa or India, these are all the kind of considerations you need to take. And you need to have an immigration lawyer who understands and who syncs their timing with the planning that Mel would do. So, Mel, if you would want to talk about the type of planning from a tax point of view for that family. So let's continue on and let's assume that the parents remain in Bermuda and don't become U.S. income taxpayers, don't become U.S. domiciliaries. Nevertheless, this particular family, the parents had said, the father had set up a Mauritius foundation. And my instinct is that the foundation has more characteristics similar to a trust than a corporation. So therefore, the U.S. would characterize the Mauritius Foundation as a foreign trust. So I've got to be concerned that if this foreign trust makes distributions to U.S. residents, the children, we could have throwback tax. And so one of the considerations is to perhaps leave the foundation in place, manage the distributions of the income every year and gain every year so that the Mauritius Foundation might make distributions to U.S. trusts for the children. And the reason would be that would take away the throwback tax because once the money has been distributed to U.S. trusts, U.S. trusts are no longer subject to throwback tax, whereas foreign non-grantor trusts that make distributions to U.S. persons are. Now let's take the assumption that maybe the parents say, well, it's great to be in Bermuda, but we want to be even closer to the children. And we're going to move to the U.S. Now I've got to be concerned with the other anti-deferral tax regimes. And so uh, what I would consider is to the extent that the parent, the father or the mother, have any South African companies that never had U.S. source income and always did business in South Africa, I would likely say to them, before you come to the U.S., let's make a check the box election on those South African companies. That way, we will avoid controlled foreign corporation status, avoid PFIX status, and the father, if he owns all the stock in the South African company, should be able to get a U.S foreign tax credit for the taxes paid by the company in South Africa. And that's a nice arrangement because it will provide the most efficient, lowest tax result in all likelihood. And you won't have to deal with guilty and you don't have to file a 5471, which is a form you have to file when you have a CFC. So that's a quick synopsis of what we would do. I might also, for example, before the parent becomes a U.S. domiciliary. So this could occur before the parent moved to the U.S., but probably better to do it while still living in either South Africa or Bermuda. In David's example, the father might set up a drop-off trust, which says, I'm going to put 80% of my total net worth into an irrevocable trust 
so that if I die while I'm physically present in the U.S. and the U.S. tries to take the position I'm domiciled there, because remember, that's a question of intent, the use of the irrevocable trust in which the father would have no retained powers and there would be an independent trustee should preclude and prevent U.S. estate tax on the, let's say, uh, foreign assets that are put into the trust. The difficulty in uh, this type of arrangement is if the father sets up this drop-off trust within five years of his residency start date, that trust, regardless of the terms, will be treated as a U.S. grantor trust for the period of time in which the father is in the United States. As a U.S. grantor trust, that trust will be subject to worldwide income tax on all of its income. That's a, a very quick synopsis of some of the planning considerations for this particular family that's considering coming into the U.S. Now, so we've talked here about layers and layers and layers of different rules that apply here. But how does the U.S. go about enforcing these? How, if, you know, is all this really necessary? Or, you know, if this all seems complicated to us, is, you know, is the average IRS agent going to be able to figure this out? How would the U.S. come after you if you decided not to do any of this? Well, let me highlight a case that David and I are familiar with. And these cases have tended to occur in the FBAR, Farm mm -hmm. Bank Account Reporting Area. And the Internal Revenue Service, because these are collection matters, they don't personally litigate these matters. These matters are referred out to the Department of Justice. And they're litigated in all 50 states in federal district court. The Justice Department over the last 10 years has had very significant capability and demonstrated to judges that they should enforce a so-called 50% civil willfulness penalty. That if you are a wealthy individual and you're aware that you've got to file FBARs if you're a green card holder and you don't, the U.S. government will go after you for collection of a 50% civil willfulness penalty, meaning that if, as in the case of Mr. Schwartzbaum, a much litigated case from Florida, who was the green card holder, and let's say he had $20 million of foreign bank accounts that he didn't report, and so the IRS assessed a $10 million civil willfulness penalty, turned it over to the Justice Department, they began to litigate. And Mr. Schwartzbaum won several rounds, but lost on the big issues, and uh, we're now out to the point where because of post-judgment interest um, and some other penalties, Mr. Schwartzbaum owes the United States government $20 million. And Mr. Schwartzbaum moved from Florida back to uh, Switzerland. He had a number of assets in Switzerland, probably worth about $50 million. The uh, Department of Justice went to the judge in Florida and said, Your Honor, there's no more assets in the United States that we can find. We want you to use your equitable power and give us authority to go to Switzerland and ask the Swiss government to enforce this judgment. Now, the Swiss are known for being very reluctant to uh, get involved in these types of matters, but obviously the United States carries a very big stick. And my suspicion is that there'll be some type of settlement because the Department of Justice has contended that Mr. Schwartzbaum transferred lots of assets to friends and family, and that's a transfer to defraud creditors under our concepts of fraudulent conveyance. And so I suspect since the Swiss don't want this to get out of hand, that there'll be a way that's worked out that whether Mr. Schwartzbaum uh, repays the money or there's a lien on those accounts that the IRS can identify for the Justice Department, there will be enforcement. The U.S. will get paid from the foreign assets that Mr. Schwartzbaum has. That would be my prediction. When David, on, on, on that point, I grew up in a border city. I grew up in Windsor across from Detroit. And I remember I grew up, my father would wake up in, in Canada and go work in the United States. So I kind of grew up with Canada, U.S. tax treaty and, and all these issues. I had U.S. citizens in my family because they were having anchor babies was kind of the sport that every mother would have when she'd have the contractions run across the bridge and have, have children. So I was very familiar 
with those kinds of issues. And you're quite right, for a long time, although they had the tax liability, it wasn't really enforced. Either people weren't aware or it wasn't enforced. But what has changed over the period of time is their ability to find you and their ability to collect. So as a result of, you know, we brought brought in the qualified intermediary regime, then UBS abused that, then that, then we got FATCA, and we, you know, a bunch of mutual collection agreements. So what has happened is the abilities now for, uh, you know, I'm sitting, I'm a Canadian sitting here in in Poland right now. I open up a Polish bank account. They're asking me W9 or W8 Ben, you know, am I a US person or not? Because if I'm signing a W9, that means that that bank, which may be a Polish only bank, is report withholding and remitting to the US because they're QI signatories. So what is happening is is information, whether the the person wants it or not, if they're a US citizen, and of course now in 2023, you show a lot more documentation on, on KYC and AML in opening an account than you would have in 1973. Now they're looking at, oh, let's see your passport. Oh, birth to place, you know, Wichita. And, you know, that, oh, this means you have, our compliance says this means you have to have, to have a W-9. So as you get the IRS is, as we all know, quite behind with regards to computerization, overwork, et cetera, et cetera. But if your whole planning is, I'm going to continue to get away with this, that's not a very smart plan because it's not really a question of will they catch you? It's when will you ca catch it? And we get lots of people say, well, yeah, but I'm dead. So I don't care. But is this really something you want to pass on to? It's the answer you know, to all to, tax problems. Just die. yeah. The, the, the point of your uh, of this whole podcast is no. These aren't problems that you want to leave to your children and your grandchildren. And let me to add to David's comment: the Department of Justice will pursue executors and fiduciaries who hold assets of people who are non-compliant for mm -hmm. FBAR purposes. So you can be assured. Even if those people are in foreign countries, the U.S. government will try to enforce the predecessor's liabilities against executors. Um, the, the Jones case is a good example of that. It's got a new name. It's a, and I don't recall, but the Justice Department is going after the executors of the estate of Mrs. Jones, who was non-compliant with some FBAR filing obligations. And uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, and I may be editorializing a little bit, but my, my understanding is that this sort of enforcement is likely only to increase if it does anything, just because politically, this is sort of, you know, the, the government's obviously always looking for funding and for people to tax. And this is sort of like not a very powerful voting block that has an inordinate amount of money. So they've sort of identified people who live abroad as like a, a sort of a juicy target for enforcement where sort of both parties can kind of agree that like, oh, yeah, get them. You know, without it, it, without making anyone in their core constituency too angry. Yes, David, that's a correct statement that the group of individuals wishing to give up U.S. citizenship or give up long-term green card status has no lobby in Washington and no sympathy in Washington. I like to tell people that there are rules that have to be complied with, but there are opportunities for individuals who can plan ahead. Why? Well, if you're thinking of leaving the U.S. and you have a lot of worldwide appreciated assets, and you're, let's say you are a U.S. citizen and David's gotten you uh, a, an EU passport, and so you've got a second passport, whether Malta, Greece, or some other country, Portugal, this individual in the at least the year before the year of expatriation might say, I have an opportunity to make a transfer to a trust called an expatriation trust, and I can do up to about $12.9 million. So let's say I do $12 million, and I pick most my most highly appreciated assets, which if I held them when I expatriate, they'll be subject to exit tax. So the advantage of this expatriation trust is twofold. Number one, any of that appreciation Let's say it's it's in a partnership and I can get a discount for the partnership and I can substantiate the discount. Then the appreciation 
is not subject to the 23.8% mark-to-market exit tax regime. That's good. Moreover, since when I set up the trust, I'm still a U.S. citizen, I'm not classified yet as a covered expatriate, that means that as to that trust, the distributions back to my U.S. heirs made after I give up my U.S. citizenship are not subject to inheritance tax. Those are two big pluses, but you need to do it not the night before you want to give up your passport, the year before your passport. And if you can do it at least five years before you give up your passport, then there will be no need to even disclose that transfer into trust on the form 8854, which is the expatriation statement. In the expatriation statement, not only do you have to certify to full U.S. tax compliance for the prior five-year period, but you also need to attach, and many accountants forget to do this, a statement state providing the IRS with all significant changes in your assets and liabilities, meaning that if you set up a multi-million dollar trust two, three years before you expatriate, you may not have exit tax, you might not have inheritance tax for your heirs, but you must disclose it in the statement to the form 8854. Otherwise, I would be very concerned that you have not fully certified to full U.S. tax compliance and you're a covered expatriate. Well, and another one of the things, I just wanted to make a comment on, on the increased enforcement. There is no senator or representative for rest of the world. So there, there, there was, I remember somewhere in U.S. history something about you know taxation without representation, but we won't go into the philosophy of that. It's what the reality is. And a lot of the, one of the, the, the major problems I know amongst immigration consultants or salespeople or even immigration lawyers, U.S. immigration lawyers, is they're completely oblivious to this. And even if they know it, they think things like, oh, well, I'll get my client underneath the $2 million mark by doing a gift. And so it's, I'm often contacted by people saying, okay, David, what's, you know, what's your fees to get me an appointment and we're going to, you know, renounce citizenship ASAP or to fill out an I-407. And, and I say, well, I can get you the loaded gun pretty quickly. But you want to make sure that before you pull the trigger, or we pull the trigger, that you've talked to Mel and he has made sure that you've got everything in place. Because that cute little gift you're going to do, if it's within the same year that you renounce or, or give up your 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 green card, you've lost your that that full unified credit. So you may be triggering a gift tax that you wouldn't otherwise do. But if we did it, the gift in year one, and then you expatriated on you know, January 2nd in, in the following year, completely different result. But your average immigration lawyer would be completely oblivious to these types of things. And I would add to what David saying, uh, a recent phenomenon where I've had clients with multi-million dollar IRAs and they're about to expatriate. Well, in the situation of my Scottish client, he expatriated already. He expatriated in 2021. There's nothing I can do. What does that mean for his IRA? Well, under the special exit tax regime for eligible and ineligible deferred compensation, the rules go something like this. If you have a 401k and you're savvy and you notify the IRS by providing them with, not you provide a custodian in the US, Fidelity or Schwab, whoever runs your 401k plan, if within 30 days of your expatriation date, you provide the custodian with a form W8CE, covered expatriate, then you may be able to defer the income tax until you retire. But if you don't file that form within 30 days of leaving the US, you're going to have immediate taxation of your 401k. Now flip over to the IRA. No chance for deferral. Whatever's in the IRA is going to be subject to ordinary income tax as part of the expatriation. However, there's a huge advantage to not waiting to accelerate the withdrawal from your IRA. The 
if you have an IRA on expatriation, you have a deemed distribution. You don't have an actual distribution. That makes a big difference for the following reason. If I take money from my multi-million dollar IRA before my expatriation day, I'll pay the US tax. Let's say I'm living in England, I should be able to get in the same year an offsetting foreign tax credit in England for the taxes I paid on my withdrawal. On the other hand, if I simply have a deemed distribution and I pay the expatriation tax on my ordinary income, that's not going to be creditable in the United Kingdom because it's not an actual withdrawal. So these little fine points are really, really important. And that's why people that do this day in and day out are so needed for people that have any level of complexity. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, in that particular guys, case, uh... sorry, David, I was just going to say, and in that particular case was an example of a gentleman who at the port of entry was identified by an official and said, you can either fly back home mm -hmm. and I can file a bunch of paperwork or here, sir, please sign this I-407 and you can go and visit your family as a visitor today. Completely unaware of the tax ramifications, everybody sitting around at that transaction. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time. I'd love to thank Mel Warshaw and David Lesperance for, for being excellent guests and, and for really helping us unpack uh, in a topic that in only 45 minutes is really not unpackable, if we're being honest. And, um, you know, this was a very complex episode by our standards, and uh, that's very much by design because this is an extremely complex topic. And I think if our reader, listeners only take sort of one lesson away from this, it's that, you know, this intersection between immigration and um, taxation is not a straight line, no matter uh, what even people in that particular industry may tell you. It's more like a Rube Goldberg machine where once you start that first domino or whatever, drop the ball in, it's going to run and run and run. And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and if, you're, if you haven't inspected along the entire way, which is a big job, you know, probably one person can't do it. But, you know, that, that's kind of what we're trying to get across. I'd love to thank Mel Warshaw and David Lesperance for, for being great guests and for you know, really helping us, you know, attempt to unpack in so much as we can in 45 minutes, uh, a topic this massive. Thank you, guys. Thank you, David. A pleasure, David, anytime. And uh, for all our listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.